Mitchell and Webb have this sketch about two Nazis. Hans, I've just noticed something. These communists are all cowards. <laughs> have you looked at our caps recently? Our caps? The badges on our caps. Have you looked at them? What? No. A bit. <laughs> They've got skulls on them. <laughs> hmm? Have you noticed that our caps have actually got little pictures of skulls on them? Uh, I don't... Uh... Hands. Are we the baddies? <laughs> From our perspective, it seems very obvious that the Nazis were baddies. But most of them didn't see themselves that way. Humans tend not to see themselves as the bad guys. But what was going on? I mean, were there just a lot more psychopaths than normal in Germany at that time? And if you were born in a different time and place, what kind of attitudes would you have? Would you support genocide? Would you think slavery was okay? Would you think this was the height of fashion? It's easy to think no. After all, things like these don't feel like things we need to be told. But babies born in the past and babies born today are born with more or less the same brains. Which means that if we can learn about why people thought the way they did in the past, we also learn about ourselves. And that consequently, this country is at war with Germany. And the lesson is, you're the Nazi. You think, well, I'd be Oskar Schindler, I'd be rescuing the Jews. It's like, no, I'm afraid not. You're against the thing that makes this country a unity and that makes this country great. And I, I, think, you're, I think you're a disgrace. Now, most of the people watching this video are from countries with a Christian heritage. So if we want to understand how people used to think about morality, let's start there. Pope Francis, the current Pope of the Catholic Church, will often proclaim the importance of human rights, but you can't say the same for all of his predecessors. In 873, John VIII, who was Pope at the time, declared the enslavement of fellow Christians a sin but he didn't condemn slavery more generally. And the Bible, well, parts of the Bible contain good and timeless moral advice, but other parts, yeah, not so much. Here's an example of the Israelites aggressing against another tribe, where God commands as follows. Now kill all the boys and kill every woman who has slept with a man, but save for yourselves every girl who has never slept with a man. Yeah, I guess the people who wrote this part of the Old Testament didn't share our notions about war crimes. But here's another quote from the Old Testament, this one about slavery. Your men and women slaves must come from other nations around you. From them, you may buy slaves. Also, you may buy slaves as children from the families of foreigners living in your land. These child slaves will belong to you, and you may even pass them on to your children after you die. You can make them slaves forever. But you must not rule cruelly over your own people, the Israelites. So in other words, human trafficking is bad if it's done to your people, but if it's done to foreigners, then have at it. Look, I don't really mean to bash on Christianity here. All religious texts contain good parts and bad parts, but it's interesting to note how tribal parts of the Old Testament are. It's kind of like, love thy neighbor, but foreigners? Not so much. When we look back at historical atrocities, they often had a certain pattern in common. That pattern is kind of like, take care of your family, your tribe, country, fellow believers, but you can enslave people. I mean, you can rape wives and daughters and kill the rest. You can commit genocide. As long as they're Jews, non-Jews, Armenians, Muslims, non-Muslims, Shia Muslims, non-Christians, non-Catholics, non-Norsemen, non-Mongols, Blacks, non-Gauls, non-Romans, Native Americans, settlers, fellow Native Americans but from another tribe, Chinese, slaves by birth, suspected communists, non-proletarians, intellectuals, homosexuals, Russians, Tutsis, Trojans. I could go on. I'm leaving out a lot of complexity and nuance here, but I think the pattern I'm referring to is roughly accurate. Basically, various groups have often considered people from various other groups as having low moral importance and they've often been willing to commit atrocities against people from those other groups. The concept of moral circles helps to encapsulate this notion, and it also helps us to make sense of a lot of other things we see around us. 
Basically, everyone can be considered as having a moral circle, and the more you care about what happens to someone, the closer they are towards the centre of your circle. Most people will have themselves at the centre of their circle, or maybe their children. Strangers will typically be further from the centre than family members or friends. And foreigners will often be further from the centre than fellow citizens. And if you don't care about someone whatsoever, then they are outside of your moral circle. For example, I'm fairly confident that rocks are outside of my moral circle. You can hit them as much as you want. Okay, let's make this a bit more concrete. Consider, for example, Heinrich Himmler. Loving husband and father. Oh, and organiser of the Holocaust. Whether nations live in prosperity or starve to death interests me only insofar as we need them as slaves for our culture. Otherwise, it is of no interest to me. Whether 10,000 Russian females fall down from exhaustion while digging an anti-tank ditch interests me only insofar as the anti-tank ditch for Germany is finished. Our concern, our duty, is our people and our blood. We can be indifferent to everything else. In reality, Himmler was more nuanced and contradictory than how he comes across in the excerpt I read here, but if we were to take this excerpt literally, then Himmler's moral circle would look like this. Anyway, that's enough history. Let's talk vampire fiction. In vampire fiction, many vampires don't really care much about humans. brought a snack. But there are also a few funless fanatics who abstain from killing and eating humans and see themselves as oh so superior. Like for example Edward from Twilight. Here's a short clip of Edward pushing his own personal diet on James. <laughs> or consider Cersei from Game of Thrones. She's presented as caring deeply about her children and family, but not caring much about anyone else. And then there's Voldemort from the Harry Potter books. His moral circle looks pretty much like this. Okay, a few words about nuance. So calling someone nice or evil is sort of one-dimensional. You know when someone goes through a breakup and they paint their ex as this evil villain? Well, that's incredibly one-dimensional. And yes, I'm talking about you, Vanessa, you stupid evil bitch. Now compared to that, describing someone's moral circle does add some nuance, but there's still a lot of complexity we're missing if we only describe how wide or narrow someone's moral circle is. Consider, for example, the Titanic. When the Titanic went under in 1912, women weren't allowed to vote, and in many ways were treated as second-class citizens. But although women have been patronised throughout history, they've also been seen as more deserving of protection. Here's an excerpt from one of the survivors of the Titanic. But your father did not get in the light boat. Why was that? Why? Mm-hmm. Well, you know the rule of the sea, don't you? Women and children first. No man is going to take the place of a woman or child. Feel free to support me on Patreon so that I can afford a mic stand. Currently, uh, using a walking stick. Another example of nuance is that we generally care more about humans than pets, but we often treat humans less humanely when they're dying. When a dog is suffering towards the end of their life, we often take them to the vet to get a painless death. But when a human is suffering towards the end of their life, we often force them to remain alive, even if it means undergoing torturous suffering against their will. Also, many people do think that we ought to avoid harming certain kinds of beings, but also don't think we have an obligation to help those beings if we did not cause their suffering. Many people will not be concerned at all with wild animals starving due to drought, while at the same time having a very clear sense that harming a wild animal themselves would be a very bad thing to do. And many people would rather take their own child to Disney World than pay a charity to save third world children from dying, but they wouldn't kill a child in a poor country themselves, not even in exchange for a million dollars. There's this idea that over time, the moral circle of the average human has expanded. At first, we cared mostly about our tribe, a sort of extended family. But as nation states formed, so did nationalistic attitudes. People wouldn't just care about their tribe, but they'd see their entire nation as a sort of extended tribe. 
And people would also consider themselves as belonging to extended tribes based on things like culture and ethnicity and religion. And in recent centuries, we've started to care more and more about humanity as a whole. And we've also started to care more about animals than we used to. I don't want to overgeneralize about the past, but I do think that on average, the moral circle has expanded, which raises the question, will it continue to expand? I guess we don't know what people in the future will think when they look back on the morality of today, but I think there are several things that might disappoint them, that might make them wonder what the hell we were thinking. One thing that might disappoint our descendants is our lack of care towards people who live in poor countries far away. I think that the plight of poor people who live far away just doesn't quite feel real to us. Whoa, okay, okay, this is, this is happening, this is totally real. Uh, you're not here to probe me, are you? No, no, don't worry. We come in peace. I'm just here to learn about the morality of your species. So firstly, I'm just going to show you a few things and get your reactions. So here's a video from the place called China. There is a child in the street who is hurt and humans just walk past and let her die. That is so sad to see. You know, if I'd have walked past someone who was in fear of dying, I would have gone quite far to save them. I suspect I might have been quite the hero. And here we have some charities that are relatively effective at saving people from dying of poverty-related causes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm kind of busy right now. Another example is the attitude we have towards many animals. So here we have a dog who has been abused. How could someone do that? Psychopaths like that should be thrown in jail. Here we have pigs being castrated and having their tails cut off without anesthesia. They are kept in conditions that make them insane. Bacon. And, and here we have some humans who seem to be dragging a fish with a hook through its mouth and then smiling to the camera as the fish desperately cannot breathe. That is so wholesome. You know, on your planet, billions of fish are fished every day. Many of them exhaust themselves trying to escape from the nets. And of course, if they're brought on land while they're conscious, they can't breathe, so they suffer the fish equivalent of drowning. Wow, you know a lot of fun facts about fish. Now, I'm not a fish expert, but I like to nerd out sometimes too. Did you know one of the body measurements most correlated with penis length is the volume of the nose? It gets bigger if I rub it. Consider also that when we speak about animal suffering, there are many animals that we typically forget. Imagine that you had a magic wand that gave you unlimited magic powers. What would you do? Mm, make sure that no human goes hungry. I'd put a stop to all war and oppression. I'd make it so that child abuse and sexual abuse was magically prevented from happening anywhere. Oh, I'd cure cancer, of course, and maybe even aging. I mean, there's no overpopulation if I can just give people food and space with magic. And you know what? I'd make it so that meat comes from magic instead of factory farming and fishing. <laughs> Aren't you forgetting something? Oh! Oh, I I'd fix season 8 of Game of Thrones. I'm thinking of wild animals. Oh, that's right. You know, I do care a lot about biodiversity, and I'd conserve all ecosystems so they stay exactly the way they are. Okay, Nigel, get the anal probes! Yulu Chikai had a hard job. He was a Chinese advisor for the Mongol Empire, a regime that killed tens of millions of people. In one exchange, some Mongols in the inner circle argued that the Han Chinese just weren't useful to the empire and that they'd be better off getting rid of them. But Chikai appealed to their self-interest and argued successfully that more could be gained from taxation. Chikai was highly respected by both Genghis Khan and his successor, Ogade Khan, but Ogade was also reported as kind of deriding him for his empathy sometimes, saying, do you want to weep for the common people? Caring greatly for the well-being of all humans, regardless of the nation or group they're from, to Ogade Khan, that would probably seem a bit silly, a bit weak. When someone has a more narrow moral circle than ourselves, we'll often perceive that as bad, immoral, barbaric, psychopathic. But if they have a wider moral circle than us, then we'll see them as silly, naive, misguided, emotional, weak. Acts that people have done due to having more narrow moral circles than ourselves, to them they didn't seem problematic. 
even though to us they seem really terrible. But things that people with wider moral circles than us see as terrible, to us they don't seem like a problem. And if someone makes analogies between beings that are firmly inside our moral circle to beings that we don't really care that much about, then that will come across to us as offensive, almost as an insult. There are parallels between the Holocaust and what we do to animals. <laughs> Controversial. Uh, yeah. I'm actually Jewish. I find that not only controversial, I find it deeply like disrespectful almost, like I don't see how you can possibly draw comparisons. And an argument that can be used at every step of moral circle expansion is a warning against dilution. Don't see it as your responsibility to help everyone in the area, you should prioritise your family. Don't care about foreigners, there are still so many people that need help in our own country. Why spend your time trying to help animals when there are humans living in poverty? I've given many examples in this video of people with more narrow moral circles than ourselves, but now let's give an example of a guy who probably has a wider moral circle than many of us. Let's talk about Brian Tomasic. Brian tries to avoid stepping on grass because he thinks that stepping on bugs probably leads to an overall increase in the total amount of suffering. He has a special focus on reducing suffering, especially extreme suffering, hence the name of his website, reducingsuffering.org. And here he has lots, and I mean lots, of articles on guesses about how much direct suffering is caused by the consumption of various types of animal-based food, whether it's likely that bugs feel pain, the balance between happiness and suffering in nature, how many wild animals there are in the world. I could go on. Here's an excerpt from his 50-minute video about dust mites. I'll mention that I think it would be helpful to learn more about pain, preferences, learning, and memory in dust mites. How about being crushed? Do dust mites have sensors to detect crushing and feel pain from it? How about drowning? Now, I think that some people will feel as if Brian is being silly for making a 50-minute video about dust mites, but keep in mind how many dust mites there are in the world. We don't have good numbers, but rough estimates suggest that there could be somewhere between 100,000 and 100 million per human. The number of dust mites in a single home can sometimes exceed the human populations of entire countries. Here's another video from his channel that is simply about an ant that was trapped in a puddle. This is another video that I think some people will find weird. But what if you were that ant? Is it your guess that this ant, this very distant relative of yours, can't suffer? That it doesn't have feelings? And if you don't think that there is anything that it's like to be an ant, how confident are you about that guess? The animal group called arthropods includes insects, mites, and various other insect-like creatures. We don't have good numbers, but one estimate suggests that the number is probably somewhere between 100 million billion and 10 billion billion. In a way, what's weird is that we aren't more curious about what their lives might be like, that we don't spend more time thinking about how we might be able to make their lives better or to help them avoid suffering. So, it seems that everyone can be described as having a moral circle of some kind, and some people have wider moral circles than others, and it seems that over time, our moral circles are expanding to include more beings. But is there a correct place for our moral circle to fall? Or is this all just completely arbitrary? If some guy only cared about people who had red hair and one leg, then as long as all red-haired, one-legged people were fine, the world would seem like a good place without any problems, even if it was filled mostly with suffering. And he would see no reason to change. He might think, sure, if I start to care about all humans, then maybe I can help more humans or avoid hurting them, but what's the point if they haven't got red hair and one leg? Would a guy with this perspective be wrong? Are there any right answers to questions like that? Well, that's something that I'm going to get into in part two of this video series, which will be about moral blind spots. 
I hope to release that video in a few months from now, so if you want to see that video, as well as other videos that I have in the works, then maybe hit the bell icon. Anyway, we'll talk more about this later, but let me just say already that I'm a fan of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Earlier in this video, I said that the Bible contains good parts and bad parts, and the parts that proclaim support for the golden rule, well those are among the good parts. And it's not just in the Bible where you find this kind of thinking expressed. You find similar sentiments expressed in Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, Confucianism, Taoism, and also various other religions and philosophies. I don't think we have it in us to be completely impartial. We'll continue to care more about our own children than other children, and we'll probably always have a bit of a bias towards our own species. But we can become better at asking ourselves golden rule-like questions. What if I were to be born into the world as a random being? All the effects that the things I do have on conscious beings, as well as the effects of the things I don't do, what if I were the one who were to live through those consequences? What if it were me? As we become a more powerful species, it will become easier and easier to help others while also living good lives ourselves. And as we grow up as a species, I hope that we'll start to care more and more about the world being a good place to live for everyone. For anyone who is capable of having good or bad experiences, including domesticated animals, wild animals, even invertebrates. But maybe not the French. Anyway, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, then maybe consider checking out the pinned comment for more videos you can watch. A special thank you to my Patreon team. Without you guys, this wouldn't be possible. So thanks so much for your continued support. And if you're someone who isn't currently a Patreon, but you find my videos valuable, then please do consider supporting me because it really makes a difference and allows me to use my time to make this kind of content for you. Okay, with that said, thank you so much for watching and I will see you very soon with another video.